Okay, church, we're excited to start our family series this weekend. We're talking about picture perfect, family unfiltered. Can we get real over the next few weeks? As one of our famous comedians once said, can we talk? We're going, we're going to get into it. We're going to talk about family life and uh, single moms and uh, divorce and uh, sex life and parenting. And we're just going to talk about every part of family life. But we all know how family life is. It's kind of like that picture. When you're taking a family picture, you're trying to get everybody in agreement, right? Husband, will you show up? Kids, will you be home? Dog, will you be nice? And we get to everybody, and then we get, could everybody please smile? And then you have that one child who can't keep their eyes open, right? Always have their eyes closed for the picture. So, you know, sometimes it can become drama. And you all act so innocent when I'm teaching here. You act like you have no idea what I'm talking about. But I know that you know that I know that you got some issues in your life just like I got some issues in my life. So you can act all innocent and everything, but I've been following your Instagram. <laughs> you know, on Instagram, we all want to look so good, right? And, and even the professionals don't look like they look on Instagram. But we're all trying. Right, so you got to get the right picture, the right angle, got to hold the camera up because then you look better, hold it like this, we don't want to see your nostrils. We're all kind of look picture perfect, but what is it really when we are unfiltered? And that's the reality of family life. And so we're going to get into it and talk about it. We know over this past year, our world and the circumstances in our world has brought about many things in family life that are not good. For many, the pressure, the, the changes of working at home, changing jobs, struggling with health, those issues created stress on our families that we weren't prepared for. Divorce is up over 20%. And divorce was already high before last year. So that means over half our marriages are failing. It includes Christians, which you would hope would not be a typical statistic. But the fact is, most of us are. And just a real brief answer. Why are so many Christians typical when it comes to the statistics that the world gives? It's because we believe, but we don't live. We embrace the ideas of God, but we don't practice the ways of God. So we go through the same problems and have the same disasters, but God shows us how to overcome, how to come back, how to get healed, how to be restored. And we're just going to get into it for every aspect of family life. We know that drug abuse, alcohol, uh, suicide, all those numbers are up. Uh, over the next weeks, we'll probably be sharing a few of those numbers just to show, just to reinforce the idea that we're facing more than just a virus. We're facing challenges in many areas, but God gives us answers. God shows us how to win. And for God, family is priority. More important than anything in your life, God views your family, how you deal with family. So we're going to talk about it, and uh, we're going to have a good time. Now, here's an interesting uh, reality. Our young adults, our millennials, are getting married less, getting married later, and not having children or significantly less children. So that kind of gives you a perspective of what they think about marriage. I'd rather avoid it. Well, what do they think about children? Not interested. It's a sad story because historically, people find that life and find that love and find that joy in family and in having children and raising kids together and living and dying together. But our millennials are not thinking that way. 
And it may have to do with they don't see God in their world. They don't see hope in their future. They don't see how to make it work. I'm going to bring some answers to that later in the message. But the key that we hope we can establish in these next weeks, and we're going to have panels. Wendy and I are going to teach together, and then whatever she says, I can straighten it out. (laughs) Or whatever I say, she can straighten it out, right? We're going to have some fun over these next weeks, so get ready. Bring a friend, right? Bring somebody who really needs healing in their home, and let's believe God to do some miracles here. But The first thing we want to make sure is that we establish the reality we need to build on God's Word, God's ways, God's plan for life, God's God's foundation. And if we start there, every marriage can work. Every parent-child relationship can work. Every family can prosper. Hear what I'm saying. If we will build on God's foundation, every family can prosper. Oh, pastor, you don't know my marriage. You don't know what I've been through. It it will never work. God is able. And okay, many of us have been divorced. We've been through the disasters. Many of us have pains when it comes to family issues. God heals God restores, and God can bring a new and better relationship. But the beginning of whatever God wants to do in our family life is building on his foundation. Okay, so I'm going to have a little construction project with you today. I got some foundation blocks here, right? You builders know about these foundation blocks. They are uh, typical on construction sites. Most of our homes were built on cement slabs, but you probably have some building block somewhere in your garage construction or your home construction. And they're just simple blocks. They're not real pretty. They're not real cute. There's nothing stylish about them. They're just foundation stones, just blocks that we build on. And uh, if you don't have a strong foundation, what happens at your house? How many have a break in their sheetrock because foundation settled? How many have a leak in their basement because the foundation failed? Water coming in, got problems, start smelling. It's hard to fix. It's hard to go back and fix a bad foundation. Really expensive. So it's important. Have a good foundation. Build a solid foundation. If you don't, you'll pay the price. It'll be a problem. The day will come where you wish you'd have built better. You'll wish you had thought. You know, many people spend more time getting a driver's license than they do getting prepared for marriage. We went to a class, we read a book, we took a test because we wanted that driver's license. You didn't do any of that for marriage, nor for parenting. Do you know most people spend more time looking for a wedding dress than they do reading material about marriage? Wendy and I and our pastors here at Christian Faith, we've done dozens, hundreds of weddings through the years. I've never met a couple who spent more time studying and praying for their marriage than they did on the ceremony. In other words, we want a picture. We want to look good. We want to be pretty. I have a dream for my wedding, and I can't, I can't get married until I have enough money to go to Hawaii. <laughs> Wendy and I had $500 when we got married. We got married right here at the Mill Creek campus. $500, one of the Friends made a carrot cake, and Wendy borrowed a dress, and, you know, that was all we had. Uh, We drove to the the great destination site called Oregon. (laughs) That was our honeymoon. Car broke down, didn't even make it that far, but, you know. (laughs) However, 43 years later, we're still having fun. We're still living life. We're still doing our deal. The ceremony, 
is not the important part. The dress, the picture is not the important part. What's behind the picture? What's unfiltered in your picture? Okay, so I got my little, this is a stupid foundation. (laughs) Why? Because I just wanted it to look cool for a minute so I could get a picture. (laughs) This is not how you build a foundation. You never see the foundation. You never look at the foundation. You look at your roof line. You look at your architectural features. You know, you look at your landscaping. You don't look at the foundation. The foundation is just there. And if it's done well, you never think about it. If it's not done well, you got leaks, you got cracks, you got problems. Your house is settling and sinking, and it's a bummer. Same thing's true for your marriage. What's your foundation? What did you build on? What was the, the groundwork? What was the, the part that kept everything from settling or cracking? What was it that got you through the pain and the troubles and the stresses and the strains? That's what we want to talk about. Building on God's foundation. Have you thought... Are you aware, do you know, when I get married, I'm talking to single folks, I will build on God's foundation. And if you already are married, have you thought, are you aware, we are building on God's foundation? See, if you're not, or you're not sure, God will help, God will lead, God will guide, God can bring change. It's not the end of the story. I'm just asking you, are you sure? Do you know what you are building on? Because if you build on the wrong thing, it's going to be a disaster. Do you know that marriages of over 20 years are seeing more divorces than marriage of younger people? Why would you stay together for 20 years and then give up? Bill and Melinda Gates, $100 billion, announced their divorce this week. Now, some have said finances is a cause for many people's divorce. Not having jobs, stress over poverty, stress over finance, right? Financial worries. Well, I would think $100 billion should cover almost every need but it's still not enough to make a marriage work, right? I know some of you would be like, I'd like to try. (laughs) You know, at the end of your life, you're not going to say, I wish I had more money. But you might say, I wish my family was here. I wish my relationships were still intact. I wish I'd done things a little differently when it comes to my family foundation. Let me give you a couple scriptures. Ephesians Chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. God is the author of family. Without God, family has no foundation. When you remove God and God's word from your definition of family, you end up with a man-made idea that's probably going to change with each generation. And that's one of the challenges we have right now is this generation is redefining family. Family is whoever you care about. Family is whoever's a friend. Family uh, it could be a homosexual relationship, could be a lesbian relationship, could be transgender. What's gender? Let's redefine gender. When you have a child, you can't say, yay, it's a boy. You have to say, yay, it's something. I cannot imagine asking my five-year-old, do you feel like a boy today or a girl today? But this is the definitions. This is the thinking. This is the foundation that some are building on. And it's not from God. So you and I have to make sure that we keep God and God's perspective because He created you. He knows you. He designed you. He understands you. 
and he gives you the greatest opportunity for success in life, right? That's what many Christians don't believe. God gives you the greatest opportunity for success and prosperity in life. And when you move off of God's foundation, you lose that prosperity that God has promised. So the whole family in heaven and earth is named after the Lord. In Psalm 68 and verse 5, he is a father of the fatherless, a defender of the widows, God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. Okay, so he's, he's reaching to the fatherless. He's reaching to those who have been separated, those who have been divorced, those who have had death and, and, and other problems. And he says, hey, you're still in my family and I still have a plan for your family. God is still reaching for every person. But pastor, you don't know what I've been through, but I do know God. And he's big enough to bring you back into a healthy, successful place and bless you with a great family. And notice this in Psalm 68 and verse 6. He sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. So the context is this. When we serve God, follow God, build on the foundation of God, he causes us to prosper. He causes family life to be good. But when we rebel against God, I don't want to go to church. I don't need the Bible. I don't believe that stuff. I'm doing it my way. I'm following the world. I'm redefining what it means you live in a dry land. In, in the Bible definition, dry speaks to no life, no fruit, no joy. A dry land is a dead land, a desert land. A, a land that no one wants to live in. Dry is, is the famine, the pandemic. But God brings us out into prosperity. So you really have to ask yourself, do I believe God's way is the best way? Do I believe God's foundation is the best foundation? If it is, am I building on it? Or am I following something else. The ideas, what's popular, politically correct, what I learned in public school. What am I following? What am I building on? Are you with me, church? You with me, Federal Way? You with me, friends at home? All right, let's keep it going here. I know you're so excited about this. In God's family, there's no place for women to be put down silenced, abused. That happens out of the fear of men. That happens out of the control, desire for dominance in men. In God's family, he created men and women, male and female. He brought them together. The man was not three-fourths. The woman was one-fourth. No, the two came and they became one, equal. So in God's family, we deal with the gender problem. We deal with women challenges in our world because God defines it and shows us how to do it. In God's family, there's no place for prejudice. There's no place for racial fighting and anger because God only sees you in one of two groups, the born again, the not born again. On your way to heaven, not on your way to heaven. The Bible's very clear. In God, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither Scythian or barbarian. In Christ, we are all one new person. So God does not look at us through racial eyes. Well, you say, I don't want you to say, you don't see my color. Of course I see your color, but I don't judge you based on your color. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, I no longer know you according to the flesh. I know you according to the Spirit, according to what Christ is in you. So we can deal with racial issues if we're building on the foundation of God. Without the Bible, 
we end up with beliefs and things that are very destructive. We're building on things that will fail and will hurt. Without God's word, you don't know the value of every child. From the Bible, we know that every child at conception is precious, valuable, special, fearfully and wonderfully made. And God knew you and knows your destiny from the moment of conception. So in God's family, there's no place for abortion. Now, if you've been through an abortion, there is forgiveness, there's restoration. It's not the end. God loves. I'm just saying, when you're building on the right foundation, you're not thinking, how do I get rid of this baby? You're thinking, this baby, though I may not have been prepared, I may not have wanted a child right now, God says, this baby is precious, it's valuable, it's fearfully, wonderfully made. God knows the destiny of this child, right? Maybe your parents said, I didn't even want children. God wanted you. Your father in heaven wanted you. And he knew your gifts, your talents, your potential even before you were born. So that's why we've got to build on God's foundation, not the foundation that humanity has created. That won't work. It will bring pain and problems. But God brings answers. Marriage and family will be the greatest thing, the most rewarding thing, and the hardest thing that we ever do. Right, now Wendy and I have done a lot of things in our years, right? I'm 65, she's 64. I'm 66 tomorrow, Tuesday, 66. Close enough, I'm 66. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Wendy's close. And we've done a lot of cool stuff, right? We, we built sanctuary, we built two of the largest sanctuaries in the whole state of Washington. And we've hosted conferences. We started one of the largest leadership conferences in the world for many years, led, hosted that conference. And Wendy started women's conferences before there was women's conferences, right? Most of you weren't born. She was reaching out, lifting women, empowering women, leading women. So we've done a lot of great things. We built in places where they didn't want us. City council voted against us time after time. Just said, we don't want church. We don't want you. You will never have a church there. You know what? We're there. And that city council, not there. I had several city council members meet me privately and say, Pastor, you should quit now because it's never going to happen. You know what? We built their garden. Where are they? Well, they're buried out behind the church somewhere, right? I mean, spiritually speaking, right? So all I'm saying is we've done a lot of things that were very difficult, very challenging, raised a hundred million dollars for the work of the Lord, some very big challenges, but nothing as challenging as keeping our marriage together, raising our children for God. Now that they're adults, it's so good to see them in church serving God, tithers, givers, prayers, lovers. Thank the Lord. That's the greatest challenge and the greatest reward. And none of us will say on our last day, I wish I'd done more in business. Wish I had more money. Wish I had a bigger house. But all of us on our last day will want our families there and we'll want our relationships to be good. So that's why it's the most rewarding and it's the most challenging. So we, we have to make sure we're building on God's foundation. We're not following the thoughts of the world. One of the things that is popular in our schools right now is critical race theory. And there are probably some good parts to critical race theory, maybe some good ideas that we should all learn. But you're probably having, if your child is in a public school, even to the first grade, they're being taught critical race theory. One of the things that you need to realize is critical race theory sees everything through racial issues. That's the big deal, racial issues. And everything is judged. And it's not about equality, it's about equity. But equity is defined 
in a unique way. You should understand that. And you should ask yourself, is this Bible? Because the Bible says, in God's eyes, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free. God doesn't see you nationally. God doesn't see you racially. He sees your heart. And we're to be like God. We are to follow God. So if you're raising your child with critical race theory, you're not building your family on a solid foundation. And if your child spends six, seven, eight hours a day in public schools being taught, you're probably not teaching them that much every day. In fact, you might be teaching them for a few moments every week. And then when they grow up and leave church, don't follow your beliefs. You'll say, what happened? That's what happened. You didn't build on God's foundation. Many of us build on what I call quiet beliefs. Right? We, we have quiet. My dad was very quiet. He didn't talk. He worked alone. He was a carpenter. And then when he got home, he went out to the barn, and, and the horse didn't talk, so he was happy there. So I grew up in that kind of a home. And oftentimes, the quiet beliefs, you, you think, well, everybody knows what I believe. They don't. And here's what you need to remember. A quiet belief is a powerless belief. Because power comes in words. Right? God said, let there be light. God said, let the earth bring forth. God said, let us make men and women. God said it, and that's where the power came, and you're made like God. So it's not what you internalize, it's what you speak that has power. So if you're not saying it to your children, they're not getting it. Somebody else is telling them something different. Someone else has more power in your child's life because they're putting words into their soul. So we parents, we got to bring the word. We got to say it. By the way, just because you're thinking about God doesn't mean you're praying. Jesus said, when you pray, say. Proverbs chapter 18, death and life is in the power of the tongue. Your words are what bring your prayer. Your words are what bring your faith. Your words are what bring the power. So a home with quiet beliefs is not built on the Word of God. It's built on something else. A home that's built with words from the Bible, words from the Lord, that home has power and is built on a sure foundation. All right, I'm running out of time. Quickly, let me give you a couple more scriptures. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith. Now, you and I can make a lot of mistakes, right? We can mismanage our money. We can not be good in prayer. We can not do something else that God wanted us to do. But he says, if you don't care for your family, you've denied the faith. And the old King James says you're worse than an infidel. The new King James says worse than an unbeliever. So that's how much of a priority family is to God. Now again, we've all been through our failures, so God heals, God restores, no condemnation. Let's just get our values right. Let's get our foundation right. If we don't make family a priority, if the job is more important, the money is more important, the stuff is more important, the friends, the boys, the girls are more important, we're missing the foundation of God. And he says, we're worse than an infidel. Exodus chapter 20. Pretty quiet up in here. Everybody take a breath. Whew, okay, relax, pastor. Chill out, pastor. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. The first commandment of the ten with a promise. Right? All the others he just said, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt. This one he says, if you do this, you get a blessing. Honor your father and mother, you'll live long. What's he saying? Honor your family. 
honor the foundation of family life. Some of us didn't grow up with a father, so how could we honor father? Maybe you didn't know your father and mother, or they died young. All kinds of things happen, but you can still honor family life. You can honor God's plan for your family and where you are now. You honor your father and mother by honoring your family. Now, what if you're not sure that God has a plan for you? You're not sure that God is with you. Well, marriage isn't that important. You live with somebody. If it doesn't work out, you live with somebody else. Change genders, change spouses. No big deal. But what if God has a plan for your family? Now it affects how you believe and how you live. What if you're not sure that God has a destiny for your life? That God has a good plan, a future. The Bible says that he has a hope and a future in mind for you. But what if you don't believe that? Well, you may be like many. I don't really want to have children because I'm worried about the climate. I'm worried about the globe, the earth. I'm worried about the government, the economy. I don't want to bring children into this world. Your fear will cause you to miss God's will. How many times does the Bible say fear not? About 365. Fear not. But we live in a culture of fear. We're afraid of one another. We're afraid of sickness. We're afraid of the climate change. We're afraid of our world. That's why many of our young people don't want to be married, don't want to have children. I'm not speaking for all. There are other reasons, but this is a big one in many lives. I don't want to bring a child into this world. Why? Because my view of the future is not good, and I don't want a child to be a part of that. Well, that's a sad way to live, and you'll miss what God would like to give to you. But if you build on his foundation, you view the future with faith. And you know, though viruses come and go, God is our healer, and that God will make a way. And you know that though the climate may shift, and we don't know all the changes the earth has been through over the last thousands of years, but we know God is God. He knows we're here, and he has a plan. The thing with being a Christian is no matter what problem comes your way, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Right? No matter what, you, you don't even know. Well, you say, Pastor, this is the worst it's ever been. This is the worst in human history. No, not so. There's been a lot worse things. Plagues, sicknesses, wars, economic disasters, abuse. Been a lot worse. But in our small little way of thinking, we want to take out God and think thoughts that are put there by the world, taught by someone with an agenda. We buy in to these narratives that are presented by political parties to use for control and by media to try to bend a culture. And we don't stop and say, wait, where'd this come from? Who's teaching me? Who's telling me this? Am I on the foundation of God and his word? Or am I listening to someone who wouldn't know God from anything? So I need to get back into the word. I need to get back to what God says. I need to make sure I'm building on the right foundation, lest I have some cracks in my wall, lest I have some leaks in my house, lest my house fails and my foundation crumbles. Let me give you one last scripture. I know you're having so much fun. I can't stop. In Matthew 7 and verse 21, the Bible says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just because you have a fish on the bumper of your car doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you have a little dove on your lapel doesn't mean you're a Christian. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. And then verse 24, Matthew 7. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, 
Hears them and does them. Hears them and does them. Hears them and does them. He'll be like one who built his house on the rock, built his family on the rock. And the storms came, but the house stood strong. He who hears them but doesn't do them is like the guy who built his house on sand. The same storm came, but his house fell. Divorce, disaster, pain, breakups, breakdowns, anxiety, anger, all the stuff that we see in our families today. Why? Because we built on the wrong thing. We didn't build on the Word of God. So let's believe. Over the next week, God's going to encourage. God's going to empower. God's going to heal. You're going to stop thinking about the failures of the past and start seeing the opportunities of the future. You're going to stop thinking, I've missed my opportunity and begin to realize God has a wonderful opportunity for me. I don't care who you are, how old you are, or what circumstance you're in. God has a family plan, and you can prosper. Come on, if you believe it, say amen right there. God has a plan for your family, and you can prosper. Let's close our eyes together. Before we go, can I pray with you? If you've not been born again or you're not sure about your relationship with the Lord, could I pray for you? Let, let's get real. Are you right with God? Are you walking with God? Are you strong in your relationship with God? If not, let's start something new. Let's start building on a new foundation. We can't finish it all today, but we can start today. Could I add my faith to yours? Could we pray together before we go right now? If you would say, yeah, pastor, I want that. I want to know that I'm building on the rock. I want to know I'm born again. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you lift up your hand right now? If I could pray with you before we go, I'm not going to call you out. just going to pray with you. Lift up your hand in faith. We're going to pray together. Online friends, I want you to get in on this. I want you to be a part of this prayer with me. God can start something new right there where you are. Federal Way, you reaching out? Let me see your hand. Get it up in Federal Way. Mill Creek, you got it up? Those that want, those that need something more in their spiritual life, where are you? Let me see. Well, you say, I'm concerned who might see me raise my hand. Hey, this is about you and God. Don't, we don't care what other people are thinking. They should probably have their hand up. Over here, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, you can put your hands down. Let's pray this prayer together. Church, would you be my prayer team? Let's say it out loud. Today, Father, I believe I'm part of your family. Jesus, you are my Lord. Come into my life. Make me a new person. I turn from the world. I turn to you, Lord. I'm following you from this day on in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give these guys a hand clap right there. Amen. Stand up with me, church.